This Friday's Q&A episode is brought to you by Relief Band. Is there something in your life that's making you nauseous? Is it the sound of my voice? Or do you just get motion sick? I don't know. But if you do, you've got to check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. The product is 100% drug-free, non-drowsy, and provides all-natural relief with zero side effects for as long as needed. And this technology was originally developed over 20 years ago in hospitals to relieve nausea from patients, but now, through Relief Band, it is available to the masses. How it works is Relief Band stimulates a nerve in the wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea. Then it blocks the signal your brain is sending to your stomach telling you that you are sick. Relief Band is the only over-the-counter wearable device that has been used in hospitals and oncology clinics to treat nausea and vomiting. Now, I am not somebody who gets motion sickness, but some examples, car sickness, seasickness, hangovers, anxiety, pregnancy. If you suffer from any of those, well, Relief Band may be for you. As you're getting ready to take your next road trip or you're hopping on that boat or you're just anxious about heading back into the office, Relief Band has good news. An exclusive offer just for the listeners to the podcast. If you go to reliefband.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and no questions asked, 30-day money-back guarantee. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use the promo code CLEAREDHOT. For 20% off plus free shipping. This episode is also brought to you by Christensen Arms, the original creators of the carbon fiber rifle barrel. And if you've never shot a rifle with a carbon fiber barrel, you just, I don't know, you're just missing out on life. They're currently the makers of the lightest and most accurate rifles in the industry. I have a variety of their rifles. I'm getting ready to take them out for their yearly spin, if you will. Hunting season is just around the corner, and I'm going to go for a mule deer tag, and it looks like a cow elk, both with my Christensen Arms rifle. If you want to check out everything they have to offer, I'd say go right now to ChristensenArms.com. Actually, go there right now, but if you are not really sure about the rifle world, that's okay. Christensen Arms understands that it can get a little weird if you don't know what you're looking for or some of the terms. So they have created a Find My Firearm tool, which is a short questionnaire that will match you with the firearm that's going to meet your needs. You can take this quiz at christensenarms.com slash findmyfirearm or go to christensenarms.com and it can be found on that landing page as well. You won't regret it. Get yourself into that rifle game. And that's it. Let's dive into this. Full Auto Friday, number 73. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what is that? It came to me. I need it. All right, everybody, here we are. We find ourselves again here on a Friday. You know what it means. q and I actually pulled even more from last week's, uh, the Instagram-specific, uh, gen- uh, generic's not the right term, but the Instagram- Instagram-centric, that's the term I was looking for, q and So let us continue. Question number one. What's your opinion on service members being discharged from the military for refusing the COVID vaccine? Whew. Well, let's be very clear and, and, and land this and start this and anchor this with my thoughts on people deciding to take or not take the vaccine. My opinion is this. You should make an informed decision and have a conversation with your healthcare provider and then make that informed decision. Uh, I'm not a fan of mandates. I am not a fan of telling people what they have to do and how they have to do it. I am a fan of informed consent and decision making. So if you're going to get the vaccine or you're not, that is totally your choice. But have a conversation with your healthcare provider or a healthcare professional. Now, having said that, when it comes to service members, when you join the military, I've covered this, there is, there's not actually fine print. I just say that. It's like any contract. You need to be really careful what it is that you're signing before you sign it. You give up some of your abilities or ability to make decisions for yourself when you enlist in the military. As an example, you are not going to be allowed to put on your dress uniform and go to a political rally and profuse your support or opinions on said political rally or individual running. 
Uh, you're not going to get to choose what day of the week you're going to get to work. You're not going to choose whether or not you're going to be there for holidays and a, and a litany of things in between. So when it comes to vaccines and the military and specifically the military mandating the COVID vaccine, you may due to the and I'm not sure of the legalities on this, but I'm pretty sure that due to the fact you are in the military, a member serving in the United States military, that you are going to have to follow the lawful orders that are presented to you. Now, having said that, from the people that I have talked to specifically inside of the SEAL community, what they are doing is they are laying out the lawful order, and then they are laying out the consequences for those who choose to not follow that lawful order, which is actually another way to describe informed consent. If you make this or an informed decision, not necessarily informed consent. So if you make this decision, this is what is going to happen. And so for those people in the military who are arriving at this point where they understand the consequences should they refuse it, uh, <clears throat> and they understand that they're going to have to make that choice, you've been informed on the decision, you understand what it's going to be, and if that's the route that you should choose to go, you're going to have to bear and suffer the consequences of said decision. At least you have that option. Uh, and from my understanding, they're not they're not booting people with a dishonorable discharge. I believe it's administrative uh, and it, an honorable but administrative discharge. It's something along those lines. I believe it is something that is not going to set you back in your civilian career. Uh, and I'm glad that they're at least giving you that choice. And again, for me, the answer to this, it comes back it comes back to informed decision making. That starts when you join the military. So you should know what you're getting into. So if now all of a sudden you're in the military, and it's like, well, I don't want to do this. I would, you know, I guess looking in the rear view mirror, you know, or if you had a crystal ball and you could go back, this potentially should have been something that you had thought about. At least you have the opportunity to make an informed decision. I am not a, I'm not a fan of people being discharged from the military because of this. And that is because from my understanding uh, it's not a small number of people that will likely decide to become discharged as opposed to being vaccinated. And I'm concerned about the and it, <clears throat> I should say this. I can only talk about the SEAL community, of which I am extremely removed and I've only had a few conversations. But the SEAL community is small. If you get a couple hundred members that are unwilling to become vaccinated and so they are therefore administratively discharged, the impact on actual readiness is going to be a real thing. So I'm not a fan that it's going down this route. Uh, I don't I don't know of. I'm not smart enough to create. And I haven't put enough thought and effort into finding an alternative solution to this. But it sucks. That's the bottom line. It sucks. So many things about the pandemic and so many things about the vaccine, not the vaccine, the information around the vaccine sucks, whether it be the delivery the statistics, the manipulation of statistics, the refusal of people to make an informed decision after having a conversation with their healthcare provider. It's all very frustrating. And I hate to see it being rolled into uh, potentially small sections of our national defense. I'm not even sure I answered your question, but I think that's how I feel about it. Question two, <clears throat> excuse me, any advice for someone considering moving from a location with moderate climate, the Southeast, to the West, where real winters are something we don't have much experience with. Well, this is an easily solved problem. I think there's a few things that you can do. I would get on the old Google machine and look at your average wintertime temperatures and average wintertime weather. Now, living where I live in northwestern Montana, about 65, I think, miles from the Canadian border, that's as the crow flies, the winters up here can definitely get very real. You're going to have uh, shoulder seasons where it's going to be rainy, icy, sleety, and then you're going to have a very thick and robusto winter season where you're going to get a lot of snow. The temperatures are going to be near or at freezing. And what I have noticed up here in Kalispell is there's going to be a cold snap at least once per year, and it's going to drop below zero for a short period of time. So you can do all that research wherever you are. And the one thing that I have noticed when it comes to, and people in Montana are going to hate me for saying this, this is, a, this is a hypothesis on my part. I think they talk up the winters, as in making them sound like they're worse than they are, to keep people from moving here, specifically in Montana. And the reality is, if you invest in some really nice cold weather gear, 
I don't find the winter months to be that bad. I personally, though, really enjoy the snow because I like the sports and activities that can come from that. I think it's beautiful. I like how it, it muffles a lot of the noises. It's just quieter. I love watching the snowfall. I wa like watching it collect. I like throwing snowballs at people's faces when they're not paying attention. Of course, just my best friends, not people randomly on the street. But I really like those uh, I really like those seasons. I don't like the shoulder seasons as much where it's just everything is just blah, you know, sleet and maybe snow, but then it turns into rain and then it freezes on the road and people drive off the road. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, but on that note, actually, in addition to cold weather gear, I take a really good look at the vehicle you have. And I'm going to assume, it, uh, because I don't know where in the West you're going to move, I'll just pretend that you're going to be moving up here. So we covered the cold weather gear. Uh, another thing that I would cover uh, are available outdoor activities. And another thing I would research is how much sunlight you're actually going to get. The days are very short up here in northwestern Montana during the peak winter months. And one thing I have found that helps me with that is you can change out uh, light bulbs to get a different type of UV uh, or visible light. And also I get outside as much as possible. So that's where the activities can tie in. With that though, make sure you have a vehicle that is going to do well up here. And that could be everything from the tires to the type a vehicle. Uh, you know, I don't know if I would uh, recommend driving a Prius around uh, and a nothing against a Prius. Maybe they're amazing winter vehicles, but you don't see a lot of them up here in the winter months. And there's ways around it. You could get winter tires or you could just a vehicle that has four wheel drive or all wheel drive. So I'd look at your clothing and I would look at your vehicle and how much time you're going to be able to spend in the sun and what you can spend your time with. And in addition to that, I think you're going to be good. Treat it like an adventure and, you know, wake up every day and see what the world's going to throw at you. If you have those basics that I already talked about covered, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing that you're not going to be able to overcome. And if you come up and you're slightly unprepared, guess what we have up here in Montana that maybe they don't have everywhere else. We have a bunch of stores where you could buy anything that you might need. So it's going to be okay. Don't sweat it too much. Like I said, I have a, a sneaking hypothesis that it's a local strategy to keep people out of the area. Question three, changing gears. Why are French Bulldogs so expensive? I love when you post pictures of Kool-Aid, and I want to get one for my family. I get pricing information from my local breeder, and I quickly change my mind. I know that along with being a master sommelier, you are also an award-winning dog breeder. Your insight on this topic would be enlightening. I chose this question because it allows me to address apparently a very common misconception, and that is who owns Kool-Aid? The answer to that is not me. Kool-Aid is not my dog. He is just a good friend of mine. And he doesn't like to be identified as somebody's dog. What I'm trying to say is, is that Kool-Aid is owned by no man. He hangs out with whoever the fuck he wants to, whenever the fuck he wants to, and does whatever he wants. Um, he's an amazing beast. I don't even know if there's ever been a better beast on the face of the planet, but I can't say that he is mine. So I actually don't know what he cost, but I bet it was probably a few thousand dollars. I think that's French Bulldogs are pretty much going to land at that price point. And as the answer as to why, and I think it's because they're pretty awesome. Um, I recently was shown what the Reels button does on Instagram. And I was also shown that if you like one of the Reels, they'll show you more of those. So my Instagram Reels shows two things. It shows car detailing and essentially Frenchie videos. Um, and it's my happy place because I could watch Frenchies all day long. So sorry that I can't answer your question. I don't actually know what they cost or why. But like I said, the reason I chose this question is so people could be informed and educated that Kool-Aid is not mine. And if you see Kool-Aid coming down the road, I'm telling you right now, you better hide your mom because he might be going after her. Next question. In listening to old JRE episodes with you, it seems that the pre-divorce Andy is noticeably different than post. Can you tell that in yourself when watching back? So I don't know if I've ever gone back and watched uh, any of the JRE episodes that I have been on, and I actually wish you would have given me a little bit more amplifying information, as in what differences do you notice? Um, I can tell you, just walking around in my own skin, that one difference... Uh, that I notice in myself for sure is that I am much, much happier as a person. And I want to be very clear when I say this, that, or when I say that, that I am not saying, not attempting to in any way, shape, or form, 
say anything negative about my ex-wife. The situation that we were both in was not the correct situation for both of us. And I hope, and in all honesty, and truly mean this, that she is noticeably happier as well. Uh, I think everybody walking the face of the earth has the right to be as happy and empowered and successful as possible. Um, we were both in a bad place. And I think and I hope that the new place that she is in is a better place for her because where I am now is definitely a better place for me. And maybe that's the difference that you are noticing. Um, I, I find joy in things that I used to not find joy in. I feel physically better than I used to. Uh, and I didn't realize that I was actually having a physical manifestation of uh, being in a situation that I that I didn't that I shouldn't have been in. It's not that I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be in it, but I didn't, I don't want to say that, that I just should have recognized earlier was not healthy. Um, and I'm glad that I have moved on from that place. So other than personally recognizing that I am noticeably happier, uh, I don't know necessarily what you're talking about, but I definitely do feel that. And hopefully that comes across or maybe it comes across and maybe that's what you're seeing. But that's really the only change. Hopefully that answers your question. Good morning, Andy. I really enjoy your full auto Fridays. I like to live by a motto of never look back, just move forward. I do this with work and relationships. I've never returned to a previous employer, even if they've reached out to me. I don't go back with exes either when it comes to relationships, even if I've even if I've had some want to try again. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think there are times when you should try again and possibly miss out on something by not? Or do you think this is a good thought process? I've second guessed myself a few uh, a time or two when it comes to relationships, but my thought is if they really wanted to be with me, they would have stayed with me the first time. What are your thoughts? I like this question, um, and I'm going to break it into two categories, personally and professionally. I initially, I, I think this is a very healthy headspace because it allows you to focus more on the windshield than the rear view mirror. And there's nothing in the rear view mirror that you can actually change anyway. And if you spend all your time looking back there, you're probably going to hit something in front of you or, as you described in your email, miss it. But I do think that there may be a couple caveats to this. So let's say professionally, a previous employer. There are, I can think of some instances where perhaps you got involved with an employer far, far too early into their development as an organization. And they truly just were not ready for what you were going to bring to the table or what the, what you thought your job was going to be or what they thought your job was going to be. So you leave and a few years down the road, let's say maybe they find some tremendous success and they've grown to where they should have been when they initially offered the job or when you started working for them. And that instance where you could go back and realign yourself with an organization that has caught up to what it is you're going to bring to the table, I think that could be incredibly positive. So I'm not going to say with 100% certainty that you should never look back. I would say that you should sparingly look back when it comes to uh, professional employment and the opportunity, you know, giving that opportunity to that organization to grow. You might have just caught them at a bad time. And that ties into my answer on the personal side of the house as well. I've talked about uh, the advice I would give my younger self when it comes to relationships, specifically marriage in my early 20s. And I would have told myself to wait because I just, looking back now, I just didn't know who I was as a person. Um, people will grow over time. I'm not the same person that I was in my 20s. And that has nothing to do with my military uh, experience or my military service. It has to do with the, well, <clears throat> I guess in some degree it might, because the experiences that I had in that service certainly gives me a different context and an opinion on the world around me. But my personal growth and the number of experiences that I have gone through, whether they be social, emotional, um, the gain or loss of something or someone. Uh, and I guess one of the biggest things that I figured out in growing older was what it is that I am looking for, but probably most specifically what it is that I want no part of, both professionally and personally. Um, and so what I would say is I can't give you the absolute of never look back on that relationship. Like you said, maybe they would have stayed with me the first time. Yeah, but what if they, what if they didn't know who the fuck they were? 
Um, and that's why I say that I think there's a caveat here. You, I would love to be able to give people the grace that I try to give myself and let go of the mistakes that I have made and accept the growth that I am making throughout my life. Um, because I think if I looked back at my 22 year old self being, I, mean, I turn 44 in a week, I don't know how much I would like my 22 year old self, but I hope when I'm 66 and I can look back with that same amount of time period that I would really like my 44 year old self in the direction that I am headed. So in general, I think there is more to be gained by looking forward and moving on, but you never know. And I would leave it at least open occasionally to look back and give somebody that opportunity to show you how much they have grown and how much they have changed. And you might end up finding somebody that is amazing. So at a general principle, I like your idea, but just realize if you never look back, you might be uh, missing out on an incredible opportunity. I think this is the last question. Nope, two more. All right, what is the correct time to address the loudmouth father ruining all the kids' soccer games and how much pressure to his throat is too much? Well, pressure to his throat may be an answer, and it might be the answer that you want to open with, but I would highly recommend that you avoid that at all costs uh, to include walking away, uh, even if he's being a loudmouth to you and threatening to do the same thing to you. Uh, especially if you're going to end up doing that in public in front of the kids, not the scene that you want to create. So I would say the correct time or maybe the optimal time, we'll use that term, the optimal time to address the loudmouth father ruining all the kids at the soccer game. I would try to catch him when he is alone, not in front of all the soccer dads and soccer moms and soccer kids. I would just pull this person aside and just say, hey, um, you know what? What you're doing out there, the example that you're setting, the way that you are behaving uh, in front of these kids and the rest of the parents, it's not appreciated. And I would really appreciate it if you changed X, Y, and Z. Another thought could be go and talk to the coach, the kid's coach, and allow the coach to address the situation. Uh, and the way that I would do this if I was a coach is before a game, if somebody pulled me aside and expressed these concerns, what I would do is I would do a little team meeting. And I'd say, hey, kids, bring it on in. And you know what? Go grab your parents, too. And I'd have a conversation about what is expected behavior-wise from both the kids and the parents. And I would just purely address it in plain English. Like, hey, I don't want to hear anything from the parents while your kids are playing. It's not about you. And guess what? You're not the coach. If you want to be the coach, why don't you volunteer and become the coach, and then you can behave however you want to. You can be a sage on the stage. And trust me, everybody will hate you if you want to go that path. But when your kid's playing, that is not the time. So you could address it, but it might be more powerful. And you'll probably have a greater impact if you have the coach address it. Because that way he can bring all the parents in and have this conversation once. What happens is if this goes to a violent uh, confrontation towards the end of your question here, what will end up happening is you're likely going to uh, get in trouble at the very least. You might get your ass kicked because you never know uh, what kind of fight game this uh, loudmouth father potentially has, and you're going to set a really bad example in front of your kids. Uh, I'm not a fan of violence until it's actually time for violence, and then I think you should be capable of very extreme violence, but it should be used as a measure of last resort. The kids' soccer game, because somebody's being a loudmouth, in my opinion, there are far too many ways to handle that uh, without putting your hands on somebody. Last question for the week. Any top tips on learning to fly, in parentheses, with the intention of sticking to single engine? Anything you would have done differently? Uh, the best tip that I can provide you is to be consistent with your lessons. So once you start, take, uh, start taking lessons, go as consistently as possible. If you could go a few times per week, you'll get to that private pilot uh, <clears throat> license much quicker than you will if you go one time per week or twice per month. And then when you start going down the instrument pipeline, again, consistency would be the key. It allows you to keep that that volume of information that you're going to need to be able to recall pretty rapidly, uh, especially when it comes to your oral exams. Uh, it keeps it kind of in the front of your brain, and it's easily, easily recallable, or at least it was for me. When I would take a few weeks off, I would come back, and I would just take these monumental steps in the wrong direction. So consistency, consistency, consistency. And then the last thing that I will say on that is – really rely on your checklist. One of the great things about aviation is that it is incredibly checklist oriented from the pre-flight to the startup 
to the taxi, to the takeoff, to the cruise, to the descent, to the before landing, to the post landing. There's a checklist for all of those things. You actually, when it comes to the mechanics of flying the airplane, you don't have to remember that much because guess what? You can just flip a page and it's right there for you. So if you get to a place where you feel like you can do it by memory, my advice would still be use that checklist, have it there and double check your memory against that checklist. And then of course, uh, don't forget to take the time to enjoy it. Private aviation is amazing. You can kind of go where you want and do what you want. And it's a really freeing thing. And I hope you enjoy it. And that is it for this week's Four. Four. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and Share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero-star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com. And there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you can tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.